it's a real pleasure to welcome so many of you here today from the university and outside. And it's also a real pleasure to introduce Jenny, who I've known for and been reading the work of for over 10 years now, I think. Uh, Jenny's the Professor of Early Modern Literature and Culture at the University of Newcastle and has written widely on rhetoric, civility um, and reading practices, amongst other things. Um, and she's also the Associate Editor of a new companion book called Medical Humanities, which is a, a, a book project, a big, very big volume project um, with Edinburgh University Press, which is now underway and will be um, expected to be published um, next year. Um, and she's also contributing an essay to that on Renaissance Voices with the singer Richard Wistrich. Is that right? Wistrich. Wistrich. Um, the paper Jennifer's going to be giving today has prompted research into a form monograph that she's researching um, with the help of a, a Lever Hume major research grant um, on um, shared reading practices in Renaissance England and medical texts and medical readings are a large component of that, of that larger project. So this is in a sense going back to the start of that project, um, the, the, the stuff that stimulated that in the first instance. And I'll hand okay, on. thank you. Um, I was asked by... Um, the Medi historians of science and histor historians of medicine at Cambridge a couple of years ago, if I would write about something for them for a project they had on uh, gynaecology. And after a moment of panic, um, I said yes. And then I tried to get out of it. And then they forced me to carry on with it. And then I sat in the British Library looking at midwifery books, still feeling slightly panic-stricken. And then I started to find things that spoke to me as somebody who works on history of reading. And it's really, the, this paper is the um, uh, result of that research and being pressed by um, those people, so I'm grateful to them. Um, can I just ask before I start, um, how many medics are here? Okay, right, so, and how many humanities people? Right, okay, so I'll try and speak to both audiences. I am a Renaissance person, so, but the good thing about this is that their medicine was wrong, um, and I don't know any better, so that, that's a good start. <coughs> Most early modern um, books on generation were written for male practitioners. How could it be otherwise when female literacy is supposed to be so high, and illiteracy, and when women were ex excluded from formal education? Monica Green's Making Women's Medicine Masculine, published in 2008, tells the history of the laboured masculine birth of gynaecology, the shift from an oral tradition of women practitioners in antiquity and the early Middle Ages to a male literate tradition in the later, later Middle Ages and early modernity. With the advance of learned medicine, she argues, women's exclusion from formal education left them increasingly marginalised as both practitioners and patients. This argument is echoed by others, so it's a very well-established argument now. And feminist historians have worked hard to defend the knowledge that experienced midwives possessed in the 16th and 17th centuries. Yet with one important exception, scholars have not been inclined to explore the detail of the life of any single midwifery book among its possible women readers. And the one exception is Mary Fussell, a very well-known um, historian um, of medicine, who I think has talked here at Sheffield. Um, and she was exploring Aristotle's masterpiece. And one of the things she noted about that book that, that caught my attention is that, that she thought about its reception not just as written, through the written evidence, but also oral. Much harder to find the evidence for that. So this paper follows the cell's example, exploring, sometimes speculating about the use of one of the most popular midwifery books of this period. This is um, um, this book. Yeah. Uh, the Birth of Mankind, otherwise named the Woman's Book, 1545 to 1654. Now I'm going to use methods that are familiar to historians of reading, paying attention to marginal annotation, which is why it's helpful to have the PowerPoint, and marks of ownership. However, I will also attend to other kinds of evidence too, aiming to recover the history of this book's aural reception. I know it, I should be saying oral, but it just gets confusing, so I'm going to say aural, A-U-R-A-L. Taking seriously Reynolds' expectation that it would be read aloud. A key source of evidence in support of this, discussed very briefly at the end of this paper, 
is um, a little-known manuscript script by somebody called Edward Poulton, who was um, a physician. And that dialogue is dedicated... I won't say anything more about it. Can I just say, um, before I get stuck into the paper, I always find it very reassuring when people tell me how long they're going to speak for. It's now ten past. I'm going to try and speak for about 40 minutes. So, and, um, and I'll let you know. I'll give you the different stages of my um, argument as well, so you know where I am. But I'm right at the start. I just want to introduce you to this book, say a little bit more about this book. Thomas Reynolds' work, hereafter named, uh, referred to as the woman's book, is, as its longer title suggests, a corrected and augmented version of a couple of other books. Yes. <clears throat> Right, so I'm just giving you some of the background to it. So it's, there's a German source, and then there's an English language source, 1540, The Birth of Mankind. Much of this work is conventional. So with its original author, Reynold repeats advice from traditional authorities, Aristotle, Hippocrates, Galen, and then also um, Serenus. He also includes medical theories on birth of the time. Um, so it's very standard, it's very conventional. None of these ideas... He is a practising physician, but none of this is very original. Yet as Elaine Hobby establishes, Reynold is not uncritical, and he makes much of his departure from these authorities. But what is distinctive about this book, and a reason no, da no doubt for its success, is the fact that it included a study of female anatomy. I'll have more to say about that in a minute. And it also... Um, included I illustrations of, the, uh, of, uh, of a dissected woman from Andreas Vesalius's recently published De Humani Corporis Fabrica, 1543. And so this book is the first printing of these graphic illustrations in the English language. Probably because of this, the woman's book was phenomenally popular. It saw 11 editions between 1545 and 1654. Newer midwifery books came to be preferred in the course of this, these 200 years, and I'll just give you a sense of what those were. So um, these are some of the titles. I'll refer to them a bit later. These are some of the other very popular books. And then here are some very popular authors, including two women from the late, uh, from the 17th century. But we don't need to worry about these books. None of them can trump the publishing history of the woman's book. Um, many copies of which survive in research libraries. And it's the survival of so many copies um, that it's, it is one reason why I'm so interested in it. But the other reason is the unusual direct address to the woman reader in this midwifery book. And that signaled both in its title, but also explained at some length in a long prologue to the book, the prologue to the woman reader. Now, Reynold is not shy about advertising his book to, to women, those who could read independently and those who could not, either because they were illiterate or, one supposes, because they were busy in the birthing room. And there's no reason, I would like to suggest, why we shouldn't take that declaration seriously, uh, although most feminist historians do not. I want to propose, as a starting point, that we do take it seriously, take Reynolds at his word, word, if only to prompt a fresh search for evidence. So one of my interests in this as a humanities scholar in this book is trying to think about the evidence, the kind of evidence we might use. So what I am going to be presenting to you in the course of this paper is some of the evidence I, I have been thinking about. Um, yeah, it is quite hard if you want to cover, recover an, an, an oral history. Recovering the history of women's use of an early modern book, any kind of book, is a challenge. It's no surprise that historians of reading have, in general, chosen to focus on the material traces that mainly male readers left behind. The manicures, the underlining, the brief marginal comments, as well as those scrawls that suggest a user is practising his or her handwriting. Most surviving copies of the woman's book that I have viewed and I have looked at a lot are well-worn. Some of them are stained, some of them have blood stains, but they're not annotated. The few copies that have been annotated, however, fit with the paradigm that has been established by historians of reading. And I want to give you one example, really fairly standard. It's not a very exciting example, but it's just to give you a sense of um, how people tend to annotate books. 
So this is one reader. He's a physician, I think, uh, just from the British Library, and he's just marked with this symbol all the passages that relate to, um, well, I think that one's Venereal Man's Company. Um, however, as historians of reading are well aware, this type of evidence <coughs> also discriminates against book users who are not trained to read in that particular way. Heidi Brehm and Hackle complains that, quote, the cultural and material practices that discourage women from annotating their books have also made it difficult for women scholars to write them into an emerging history of reading. And now I want to give you some, um, this is <laughs> about as far as I, I come to doing any arithmetic. I've looked at 79 copies of this book, trying to establish, uh, looking at ownership marks, uh, trying to establish something of male and female use of these books. Um, of the 79 copies I've looked at, 28, 35% had signatures. Of these 24, 30% are by men. So it is quite hard to, um, to see other kinds of readers. But this was one of the facts that surprised me, is that um, of these copies, um, nine of them are signed by women. So this then became a provocation for me to think a little bit longer. Some of the short messages that women left behind in their books, too, suggest that they saw themselves as the rightful users of these um, books. So this became very intriguing to me. I want to give you a couple of examples. So um, in one copy of 1545, um, we find Catherine, this um, signature, Catherine Blacknell owns this book. And then in a later edition of 1585, we find Elizabeth Stevenson, her book, had out of Dr. Winterton's study at Grantham, and then she signs it. I'd love to know how she got hold of it. But my favourite signature by a woman is definitely this one. If you look at this, you'll see that somebody called Richard Wright has signed it at the top, and at the bottom, somebody has written in thicker brown ink, but crossed it out, Elizabeth Holt is the true owner of this book. <laughs> so I really like that one. Nonetheless, despite that evidence, none of these books is annotated. And th so that led me to think that if we want to recover the, some sense of the history of their use and their value to these women who signed their names in them, we have to look for other kinds of evidence. Now I want to, before I give you that evidence, I want to pause for a moment and tell you a little bit about ways in which uh, mid midwifery books imagined readers and really think about the gendering of their reading. So this paper is concerned with how women were imagined to have um, used Reynolds, the, the woman's book, and how they also may have used it. I'm not concerned with this book's theories of generation and whether they were right, they were not, but rather with the question of who had the opportunity to use it, who had the right to its knowledge, and in relation to this, what kind of communication it may have encouraged, how it was talked about. It would be remiss, however, to neglect the male reader who is by far the more visible addressee of books of generation in this period, Reynolds included. It is the male reader, whether he is a professional medical man or a Jack the Lad, whom the compilers of books of women's secrets try first to manage. Now, this has long been noted. Gail Kern Pastor observed two decades ago that printed anatomists of the period worry continuously about how the knowledge they communicate will be received and used by the male reader. Some, like John Bannister, the surgeon who compiled the very popular The History of Man, 1578, cannot bring themselves to write about women's bodies so risque as a subject. Indeed, Bannister may be comfortable telling his <coughs> intended male readers, the London surgeons, of his dedicatory preface about their testicles in minute detail, reassuring them that if they lose one, it doesn't really matter. However, he will not write about women's reproductive instruments. What they be and how they serve, he writes, at the start of a chapter of the generative parts. So far, I haven't got this on the quotation, you're gonna to have to follow this, this is a hard one. So far as from the beginning, my purpose has intended, that is to say, as much as of the male may be commodiously spoken of, for more, I thought not good translated to English, shall now be declared. So this is a very convoluted statement. 
In his conclusion to this chapter, he simply notes that to write about the woman's body is an affront to decorum. Similarly, the desire of Bannister's self-appointed successor, the physician Helgia Crook, not to offend the company of barber surgeons in Microcosmographia 1615 is evident from the frontispiece. The arresting image of a partially dissected woman's body displayed in a pose of modesty with her hands covering her breasts and genitalia. And it's also apparent in the advice he gives to the reader who opens the fourth book, which is dealing with um, the parts of generation. He says... Um, he says, he says um, all right, as much as was possible, we may have endeavoured by honest words and circumlocutions to modify the harshness of the argument, the description of the woman's body. And then he tells us that I found this very interesting. The material has been plotted so that he that lists, i.e., likes the pictures, may separate this book from the rest and reserve it privately to himself. It's not just the modesty of, of professional mod and, and medical men that the print anatomists want to protect, however. Reynolds' the woman's book may begin with a long address to the women readers, but almost half of the prologue, Mary Fussell observes, is taken up with concerns about this book being read by lascivious or misguided men. Reynolds worries that the woman's book will inspire the wrong kind of table talk, he says. He is concerned that men at reading or hearing shall be moved not just the more to abhor, to abhor and loathe the company of women, but also that in their communications to jest and bored of women's privities not want to be known of them with diverse other such like cavillations and reasons. The reason for Reynolds' nervousness is not hard to fathom. The woman's book includes conventional, unremarkable um, pictures that are well known from medieval uh, um, uh, medical books. So these are the, sometimes called the babies in bottles, uh, uh, difficult births. I'll come back to those, show that image again a bit later. But it also includes the Vesalian images, and these are really remarkable at the time. Um, unlike the um, diagrams of the babies in bottles, the malpresentations that I've just shown you very quickly, uh, this, these images aim to depict the body for the first time accurately, revealing the female reproductive organs, as though, Reynolds explains in the prologue, you were present at the cutting open or anatomy of a dead woman. Now, nervousness about this book is shared by many of Reynolds' readers. One copy of the 1565 edition held at the Wellcome Library is worthy of notice for two reasons. First of all, the sheer number of hands it passed through. So it's, it's got lots of different signatures in it. John Paul Burthen, 1790. John Trender, 1595. And then there are two other signatures that tell their own story. One of them is um, this one by the wife of John Trender. This is Joan Trender. Her surname is rubbed out. Book Testamarito, I signed with my husband as witness. And then more interesting for me is this one from 1687, Arthur Hartford, who says, let no man touch this book, but he that is holy. A similar nervousness is expressed by the physician William Wade, or Ward. His copy of the woman's book, 1565, is annotated copiously for his own use. I want to give you some sense. He underlines and highlights with manicules, the pointing hands, several passages about menstruation, so he's really interested, obviously, in that topic. He uses one striking two-fingered, um, um, I should be careful what I'm, how I'm using my hands, two-fingered manicule to, uh, to, for double emphasis, passage he's particularly interested in. Again, it's all about venery and man's company, avoiding man's company, just like the last guy. Throughout the book, he adds recipes in his neat secretary hand, how to re uh, cure a range of conditions, um, and he links the images of the malpresentations to their description in the text, etc. Otherwise, his investment in this book is personal, so he has poems to his wife, who died, I suspect, in childbirth. But there's one very interesting annotation right at the start of the book, and you'll just see it here. He's written at the side, at the top here, this book, in any case, is not to be lent to anybody. And yet... Despite all of that, 
Despite the worries expressed in the prologue, Reynold did want his work to be lent abroad and especially to women. Although Reynold may address almost half of his prologue to errant male readers, more than half of it is addressed to women readers. He tells us that the desired audience for this book includes midwives, not the bad good ones, not the bad ones who want to ban the book, married women and their loving husbands, and all English women. Indeed, this is a woman's book. He tells us this. He tells us that he is offering it to an English female readership, or he's offering a book that is already available on the continent in other languages. Rosalind's book has been translated into Dutch, French, Spanish, and diverse other languages. In the which countries, he says, there be few women that can read, but they will have one of these books always in readiness. And on the basis of this, he gives us a detailed scene of reading, and I want to pause over this, give you um, a lengthy quotation from it. So we've got um, a marginal note, how ladies and gentlemen have used this book. And truly, as I have been credibly informed by diverse persons worthy to be believed, there be such, since the first setting forth of this book, right many honourable ladies and other worshipful gentlewomen, which have not disdained the offer by the occasion of this book to frequent and haunt women in their labours, carrying with them this book in their hands, causing such part of it as to chiefly concern the same purpose, to be read before the midwife, and so on. Moreover, the possibility that this book is read aloud is anticipated in the text itself, especially the first book. Much has been made of the colloquial language of this work, but nothing has been made of the verbs that Reynold chooses to represent his written speech acts. Declare, say, speak, talk. He's always ending chapters by saying things like, as I have said, as I spoke about before. And while Reynold expects the reader to look at the figures, see, perceive, look, of the verbs he uses to refer to the illustrations, he imagines himself speaking about the book and the reader as listening. Now, it may seem with Reynolds that we're back at the beginning of the paper with Monica Green, um, thinking about a learned physician managing uh, women's access to medical knowledge. And to some extent, this is happening. Reynolds is setting himself up as an authority on women's medicine, and he's not very nice about midwives. Um, yet, it is surely significant that Reynolds imagines this book being read aloud within a textual community of women that includes the midwife. And whatever we may think of Reynolds' motives in seeing this commercially successful book into print, we cannot overlook the fact that he has, in effect, given up control of its contents, or has performed his willingness to do that. And it involves engagement with and discussion of what is heard. And what I want to do now is really think a bit about um, the, 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 the way in which I want to... Um, um, I'm going to jump forward a little bit in the paper to save time, but I want to think a bit about the significance of hearing a book in the period and what that might mean. And, and then I'm going to end with um, some examples from uh, the manuscript I mentioned earlier. Uh, so, yeah, so the cr- crucial question for me is we know what these male physicians thought about this book is not to be lent to anybody. So the crucial question I'm trying to think about now and address is what did women think of it if we can recover that? Did women read vernacular treatises like the woman's book, which are supposedly written for them? In this period, full literacy, the ability to read and write, as opposed to being only able to recognise the alphabet, was a precious skill. The evidence of literacy that David Cressy produced in 1980, which was based on a survey of signatures versus marks, concluded that England was massively illiterate in the 17th century, despite an epoch of educational expansion and a barrage of sermons, and women come off, in his estimation, really badly, um, um, almost universally unable to write their own names, he explains. Unsurprisingly, recognition of women's exclusion from formal education informs the stereotype of the ignorant early modern midwife, and there are lots of examples of those. So the physician Percival Willoughby, author of um, Observations, in midwifery, 1672, notes that he has met with many midwives that could not read, with several that could not write, with many that understood very little of practice, and for such as these be, it would do no good to speak to them of the anatomising of the womb, or to tell them of the learned works. 
and as Helen King has noted, Willoughby paints an interesting picture of the midwife who owns a book, not because she can read it, but only so that she can show the pictures of male presentations to her clients. There are lots of negative portraits, such as Willoughby's, which have led historians of midwifery to argue instead that access to these books didn't matter. It's all about practice. Can you do it? You don't need to be able to read the books. The books, in fact, often give very bad uh, information. I mean, Rosalind, for example, forgets to tell the midwife to wash her hands and pare her fingernails. The benefit of practical experience over bookishness in, in the birthing room is clear. In any case, King argues, Reynolds' scene of reading is implausible in view of the darkened chamber in which delivery traditionally took place. But my argument is not concerned with whether these books were useful in that room, but with the issue of who had access to printed knowledge about generation and who had the right to discuss it in the birthing room or some other location. Willoughby's portrait of the illiterate midwife is persuasive, but we only have his word for this, and Cressy's analysis of, of literacy is not without problems. In any case, hearing books was a ubiquitous practice and not just among the illiterate. As Cressy reminds us, being unable to read in the Renaissance did not mean that a person had no access to the written word. Print and oral cultures were already intertwined. Moreover, we know why men and women enjoyed hearing books. As Roger Chartier explains, it was an exercise in sociability. Reading aloud elicited commentary, criticism, debate, while the frequent and informal discussions among friends could attract others, silent auditors instructed through listening to the text being read or the exchange of arguments. And I want to pause over this quotation. I think the practice of reading aloud then and now is completely overlooked. It's really important for, in terms of the way in which you think about how information and advice is disseminated. Um, and, and I have a bit more to say about that now. But what interests me about Chartier's um, quotation is um, that he understands hearing as inquisitive, uh, active. Hearing a book generated discussion. The kinds of writing Chartier is thinking about includes devotional writings, romances, and histories. But the same argument works equally well with medical books for male practitioners. Let's not think about women for a moment. Anatomy, for instance, was as much an auditory as a visual experience, so that we know, certainly in Venetian anatomy theatres, that before you went in to see the dissection, you were, the music was played to prepare you for, its, uh, for, for the lecture. And this is also recognised in anatomy books. There's one healthier crook addressed, addresses the barber surgeons, the citizens of the physician's commonwealth, as he calls them. He was well aware that they were used to hearing the scripted word. He commends the practice instituted by the College of Physicians that a doctor of physic should read anatomy lectures to the surgeons twice a week, in Latin and in English, saying that he too has profited from the readings. Um, and then he goes on to explain that um, much later in Microcosmographia, when he's thinking about the anatomy of the ear, he has a lot to say about, sign, about sound and the uh, value of hearing. And this is um, a quotation that has... Um, been uh, with me for a long time now. I want to share it with you. It is better to hear a book, he explains. You have to remember that he's been thinking about the anatomy of the ear and why it's such an important sense. It is better to hear a book, he explains, because we have opportunity to demand a reason of some doubts from him which speaks to us and thence we receive more profit than by bare reading, from which profit a certain delight does arise. Quite simply, Books cannot digress from their discourse for the better explication of a thing, as those may, which, which teach by their voice. This scene of reading, of this scene of hearing, is lively, inquisitive, and challenging, and it is reflected, I would argue, in the composition of microcosmographia. And I want to use this to think a bit about the way in which um, anatomies might be discussed by other people. So I'm trying to build up my evidence um, before I start to speculate. So just thinking about uh, microcosmography, I won't go into, any, into it in any detail. It's organised as a history, a description of the body parts, and then controversies about that that also has philosophical speculation as well. So these are just some of the questions that he um, tries to address. Um, it, they're the kind of questions that will be disputed at university. 
But the thing that's interesting to me is the way in which he addresses them is that he opens up debate. He tries, he's not trying to resolve the controversies. And in the controversies, Crook recalls different medical authorities, pro and contra. So he's not giving us a secure line of argument. It could be this, it could be that. He's thinking about possibilities, because of his, partly because of his rhetorical education. And one can see how this book could also reproduce the same kind of discussion uh, among the uh, barber surgeons to whom it's intended, um, based as it was on rhetorical training, which privileged modes of oral exposition and commentary. Okay, so I'm rushing a bit. So you ha- hoping I'm ke- I hope I keep, I'm keeping you with me. I want to go back to the women readers now and the practical rather than literary knowledge that they might bring to a reading or hearing of a vernacular, of vernacular midwifery books. What signs are there in Reynolds' text to suggest that their knowledge might generate discussion as part of this book's use? To be sure, Reynolds does not present his readers here it is, with um, anatomical co- controversies, but he does display an in- inquisitive mind, revealing his own uh, oral, his own reading habits, and setting the tone for the reception of the book. So, what I'm going to give you very briefly is a very speculative, literary analysis of the work. It won't take me very long, but it's, it's not uh, what my argument ultimately rests on. But it is important to me. He does so. So he gives us this, this, the tone of the writing is speculative. He does so by privileging personal opinion and experience over bookish advice. And you have to remember that this is a a book that's full of um, um, ancient authorities. These are some of the controversies. It's the controversial tone he takes. You shall read certain things which in times past, he offers at the start of book one, have been corruptly, negligently, nay, yay, very falsely written off. And he keeps going on in this style in book one. Later in the same chapter, he declares, much more are to be detested and abhorred the shameful lies and slanders that Pliny and diverse others, and so on. He goes on, he's, he's always disagreeing with his sources. Okay, Reynolds' literary style and word choice are evidence of a kind that we might use um, to think about the kind of reading it could prompt. But it's not very satisfying. It won't convince any audience, I think, that it's not, it doesn't feel substantial enough. So with that in mind, I want to turn to my last source of evidence to think again about how women may have used um, this book. And this is to the manuscript I mentioned right at the start of uh, this paper, The Midwife's Deputy, um, a dialogue by the physician Edward Poulton for his wife. And what has interested, what caught my attention about this manuscript dialogue is that one of the books that's being discussed is Thomas Reynolds. So I'll move to that and then to my conclusion. So a few words about Poetum. Um, he's an obscure figure. Um, there's no record of him attending university, although he claims to be licensed in physic and surgery. He does, however, describe himself as having been servant to the controversial physician Thomas Bonham in the preface to The Surgeon's Closet. So he's not trained at university in physic, he's a, he a, serves an apprenticeship. He was an insatiable reader and habitual writer. And although The Surgeon's Closet is the only print publication to carry his name, he also left behind four presentation copy manuscripts in his neat secretary hand, and they're in the British Library. By far the longest of these is The Midwife's Deputy, about 93 pages, dedicated to Anne, Countess of Northumberland, who dies in 1637. In his dedicatory epistle, he explains it was compiled for the use of my wife, a sworn midwife, out of the works of Thomas Reynolds, physician, Guillermo, um, Jacob Roof, and Thomas Bonham. But the midwife's deputy details the virtue. Uh, sorry, the midwife's deputy details the virtues and knowledge needed of a midwife, but it also notes the role of the midwife in natural and unnatural. Um, births. Now I don't have time to offer a rounded view of this um, uh, dialogue. And there are lots, but I do want to give you just some of the evidence I want to use of how this, uh, a representation of how this book is being used certainly in this dialogue. There are problems that might suggest this manuscript fits better with Green's account of the mas- masculinization of women's medicine that I mentioned right at the start. This is another book written by a male physician for women midwives. 
Yet despite this, the midwife and her, her deputy are not depicted as passive recipients of Reynolds or anybody else's teachings. It's the way they're represented and the way the dialogue works I find so intriguing. Indeed, Poulton's two female characters are surprisingly well-versed in literate medicine, even if they don't read Latin. I'll just give you some examples. It's not the most riveting of dialogues for a literary scholar, but I am interested in the way it's structured, and I'm going to say a bit about that. What time is there that is convenient to purge such women as are with child? asked the midwife. To this, her deputy responds, surprisingly, Hippocrates in his book of aphorism, <coughs> section 4, aphorism 1, and again, section 5, aphorism 29, sets down the rule thereof in these words. Just as important, though, is the fact that the deputy tests Hippocratic aphorisms <coughs> and the advice of male physicians against her, her, against her experience. Many are of opinion, she says, that a woman with child ought not to be let blood for fear of miscarrying. And, and then she says at the end, this is the bit I really want to emphasise, this much I can speak upon my own knowledge of a young gentleman, a gentlewoman, who being with child resents let blood and did very well after it. The point I really want to make is just that the knowledge that's being shared is being tested. Of course, knowledge displayed in this dialogue is potent. So it's not really theirs, it's a fiction. However, he could have chosen, like Willoughby, a few decades later, to speak in his own voice, relating his experience and his critical opinions of what he has read in books. Or he could have chosen, like this physician, to represent, to convey knowledge in a dialogue in this way. This is Thomas Dawkes, uh, midwife, rightly instructed. You'll see the difference in tone straight away. The surgeon, so it's not two women, but it's a surgeon and a midwife, I suppose your tutress recommended to you some books, midwife. Yes, sir, she recommended to me two, the one she calls Chamberlain's Midwifery, the other Daventer's. And pray, what light have you gathered from either or both of them? Why, really, sir, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to stop put, putting on silly voices. But, <laughs> why, really, sir, I cannot say that I am much the wiser since I read them. Why, they are both reckoned good pieces. Yes, sir, they may be for aught I know but they are either of them above my understanding, and I doubt but that of my mistress, the midwife, too. True, Lucina, though there are a great many good things in both of them, yet it is certain they are not adapted to the capacity of women. So he could have done that, but he chose not to. The preoccupation of the midwife and her deputy with real situations determines how they are represented responding to what they have read in contrast to Willoughby's portrait of the ignorant midwife's use of books. This is the case in chapter 9, which deals with natural and unnatural delivery. The midwife and deputy seem to have Reynolds' book open in front of them, and they're looking at the illustrations. And I mentioned I would return to the male presentations. And they're picking them out. They talk about every single one of the male presentations. But, this is, uh, the, but the one I'm interested in is uh, number 5, the one in the middle. Um, Reynolds' pictures are referenced reference in the text thus. Um, here's the text. Um, suppose, that the, oh, right, so, so, suppose that the child lie clean across the womb, clean across, across the womb with one of his sides bending. And then, um, uh, but despite the prominence of, of Reynolds, uh, I think I've got to go back a bit. So they're um, talking about them. So suppose that the child, oh yes, suppose that the child lie, does lie clean across the womb um, with one of his sides bending unto the birth passage, as you find it both penned and portrayed by Mr. Reynold, figure the fifth. But despite the prominence of Reynold here, his advice is not accepted. So they're very critical of Reynold. In fact, Reynold is found wanting and Guillermo is um, preferred because he provides more practical detail. Deputy, Mr. Reynold only advised to turn the child around, uh, unto the true natural posture. Mr. Guillermo advises that the woman being duly placed on the bed, on her bed, that then the midwife, having her hands duly anointed, shall put up her right hand to turn the child and so the go on. So there's a, a better description of the same. The commendation of the detail of Guillermo's book is represented Sorry, it's repeated by both the midwife and the deputy many times. Um, there are lots of um, pr there's lots of praise for Guillermo. Mr. Guillermo handled this matter far more largely. 
I surely counsel that we are all much bound to praise God for that book of Mr. Gillimore's, which gives us greater light by far than any other. I cannot but highly commend the judgment of Mr. Gillimore. Mr. Reynolds, in my mind, as he speaks very little, hearest, so are his words to me obscure. But it, not everything goes um, uh, in Gillimore's favour. It's not that one author is preferred over the other in all cases. On the topic of malpresentation number six, uh, feet first, being spread about abro uh, uh, abroad at the knees, the deputy notes, Mr. Reynolds uses few words in this matter, but I can find nothing in Mr. Gillimore at all. So they're critical of him as well. But my point is simply that they're engaging critically thinking about practice. And this is a really remarkable representation of um, two women using a book that um, flies in the face of everything we've be, be, be thought for so long about the way in which books were read, uh, used or not used by uh, women in the period. And now for my conclusion. Poulton's fictional dialogue is the only textual evidence I have of the woman's book being read and discussed by women. And I did say it's very, very hard to find that evidence, to find this kind of evidence. Uh, so I was um, pleased when I did come across it. And it does not represent exactly the scene of reading that Reynold describes. So I'm undoing my own argument in a way. For example, we don't know what room the fictional characters are reading in, and the purpose of the reading is the testing of the deputy. But having said that, it does give us a rare glimpse of the use of this practical book that provides a stark contrast to the negative representation by Willoughby and other physicians of women who are meant to have no truck with the learned tradition and over which historians of midwifery have worried for so long. But I would also suggest that the implications of this kind of analysis and of this kind of book extend beyond the field of history of medicine. So really, I suppose I'm thinking that history of medicine needs a wider audience in the humanities than um, has been the case so far. The Women's Book offers a new source for the history of women's vernacular reading that is different from the decorous genres, recipe books, devotional writings, romances, with which we are slightly more familiar, and the possibility also to appreciate the knowledge and self-education of those women who were read to. And if nothing else, I hope that this analysis might remind us of what we miss simply because we can no longer hear the talk of these past, of these previous centuries, and also because we don't try to imagine that we can. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. You're okay answering the questions for 10 minutes or so. Um, I'll just ask you at the beginning, so um, if, then if you just... Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah it's okay. Could you just talk a bit more about those final sentences, the relationship between history of medicine and medical humanities, yeah, and, and where he medical and, humanities, and in yeah. general, but also how this this text fits in, and your analysis of it fits into this kind of different approach or wider constitutions of oh, medical humanities. Yeah. So, okay, right. Well, nobody really knows what medical humanities is at the moment. Um, medical humanities, for a long time, has been about. Um, please forgive me if I if I say anything out of turn, but it's um, it's been about. Um, well, it's, it's, it's really, mm, um, has been, a lot of this has been about therapy and therapeutic uses of the arts and humanities. And um, I suppose the Edinburgh companion to critical humanities is trying to move um, against that a little bit, you know, not dismiss it completely, but bring in new ways of thinking about the arts and humanities and bring those into um, um, a medical context. It's not just about... Um, writing poetry makes you feel better. It's not that kind of medical humanities. As I suppose um, a lot of my early work in this field was really not in medical humanities exactly, but history of medicine, social history of medicine. So, and I suppose this paper aligns itself a little bit with that. But in terms of at the end, what I'm uh, really trying to think about is um, more of a dialogue actually between say history of medicine, what we might think of at the medical humanities in terms of the direction it might go into, and more generally, humanities type work. So, um, I, I, I've never, if we think about the structure of our um, academic working lives, 
Um, you've got your medics in one place, you've got your social historians of medicine or historians of science in their own departments doing their work, you've got your literary scholars and historians doing that, you know, everybody's quite separated. Um, as I was working on this, I was thinking that actually the implications for this, I can't do the medical work, the implications for this, of this kind of book, as I said at the end, and this kind of work, for thinking more broadly about some of the questions that humanities scholars and historians are interested in, seem to me really important, really vast. And what are they? Um, what, which, what, I'm, I'm, the, the humanities ones. The, those questions, the issues. For, for, for which? For which? So the, the, the vast issues, what are they that would be, that are worth I, mean, I was thinking about in the humanities, things like history of reading, history of women's reading, history of, you know, the things that I'm more familiar with. I'm not going to talk, you know, talk as a, okay. yeah. But, but, but I would say the thing that's really important to me in terms of thinking about medical humanities and where it might go is that the need to broaden the conversation and to bring in some of the historical work that people do, some of the critical work that people do. Thanks, Eddie. Um, it's really fascinating, as you can imagine, by the manuscript dialogue uh, at the end. Um, I'm just going to say that because it, it looked like there was um, margin failure down the kind of inside gutter, yeah. and what that might say about, because Mark, you know, Margin is picking out certain things for readers to read, whether that gives an additional clue into how yes. the book is intended to be used. Oh, the, um, mostly it's just a yeah, different speaker. Yeah, the inside gutter. Yeah. It's a summary. It's a summary of what the, the main issue is. So it becomes a finding yes. aid. It's a finding device, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, oh, thanks, Jenny. I thought that was, that was brilliant. And um, I'm really interested in the, the sort of, I suppose it's the imaginary community of female readers or hearers that yeah. you're trying to yeah. reconstruct. But, but, mm. but isn't that hard? That's really hard to get to, isn't it? And, it seems mm -hmm. that that all of the all of the women that you, all of the female characters that you have are either women attached to men, mm -hmm. male owners, yeah, yes, adults, yes. Mm -hmm. wives in particular, mm -hmm. um, yes. or mm -hmm. they're or they're fictional characters in a dialogue. Yes, and there, there is. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but there is. Um, um, there were four London midwives. Um, it's in the longer papers. Excuse me. Four longer midwives who. Um, um, produce who work together and produce their own. I mean, there are women who are. You're right, absolutely, you're right. But it is very hard to find that evidence. Mm. However, there are these four uh, London midwives who um, write their own um, uh, midwifery book, partly because they're offended by uh, what they're reading in um, the, um, uh, the what the physicians are providing. Yeah. Um, and they pick out Reynolds' book as being the least abhorrent of the volumes that they've read. Okay, so, so it's the best of that. Bunch. Yes, but it is, you're right, it's incredibly difficult mm. to find that evidence. Mm. But the problem with that, and this is a, 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 a broader problem, is to do with, it has to do with the fact that because we, can't, we haven't got it, especially if it's oral, it doesn't mean to say that it's not there. And the, the written evidence leads us, it's like the, the printed book, it leads us to think in very particular, it structures our thinking, and, and we forget all sorts of other things to bring into, that we, that we should be bringing into um, our history, actually. Mm. So. Is it possible, though, that there's a really well-developed body of knowledge that women have, and that rests in a normal culture, mm -hmm. and yeah. it is separate from, mm -hmm. from the text? Yeah. Well, th that's what feminist historians have been arguing. They're saying, well, the texts don't matter. And, and, and we know that midwifery is by apprenticeship and that um, we know that there is this oral tradition and that is being shared, but, it, but, it, but it's not that it's not textual as well. Mm. It's moving in and out of a textual culture. Mm. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just smiling at the picture of the um, husband who can barely bear to speak of women's parts, reading this out after dinner to his spouse mm -hmm. and trying to imagine the scene as they spend a whole evening discussing male presentations. Um, but it made me wonder, actually, because obviously at this stage, reading and books still are very closeted, very restricted. So do you have any concept as to what depth or saturation this knowledge in these books reached out to? Um, well... I mean, there are so many surviving copies of the woman's book. I mean, it's incredibly popular. It has 11 editions. Um, there are, um, I, I mean, compared to, I mean, it's not a, 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 they're not very, 
if you're a scientist, they're not um, very impressive figures. But in, in terms of, compared, say, to um, other midwifery books or other um, types of literature, they, it, 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 you can see that, they, that, they, that it, has quite, it has quite wide reach. Um, I mean, if you look at inventories, um, the, if you're a literary scholar, it's really humbling because uh, if anybody's going to own any books, it might not be a midwifery book, but it would be the Bible and it would be a health book. So, so there is evidence that you can um, collect in that way to get a sense of what people are, think is important and what they're reading. Uh, <laughs> is that the kind of question you were asking about? No, I was just sort of trying to think whether it would be purely restricted still to a small handful of people attending the relatively well off, or whether the knowledge might disseminate down to communities with relatively little access to knowledge otherwise. Yes, yeah, yeah, I suspect not, but... You mentioned at the beginning that <coughs> excuse me, some of these um, copies of blood stains were Yes, yes. Like, well, one, it's one I found. One, I was one, very excited. I, <laughs> yeah, I wondered what that might mean for the situation of reading. In it. You, would, yes. you might think that you'd be reading this yes. before, yes. well in advance, when yes. did it, and, yeah. and therefore how the knowledge yeah. might be exchanged sort of actually around yeah. the, the birthing. Yeah. Well, it, one can never know. I mean, it could be, sometimes anatomy books, I don't know about this one, but they're, they're taken into the, um, uh, they're there at the dissection. So I know that some of Thomas Lawkins' um, anatomy books are bloodstained. Um, but, yeah. Um, but we can only speculate. We, you know, we can only try and imagine that. But, it's, it's, but most of the copies are actually really well-worn. They're stained, they've got bits of pages missing... And I have to say that in almost all of them, the um, pictures, the Vesalian pictures, have been cut out and removed. So they're being used in sort of all sorts of you know, thought-provoking ways. I like the images of the fetuses. They look like Olympic athletes. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Miniature Hercules. Yeah, the babies in bottles. That's right, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I suppose the point I was going to ask you is, is the, the, the counterpoint to all this. The vast majority of people who don't have any access yes. to any scientific knowledge at yeah. all, and you can see this reflected in the, the Global South today. Yeah. Uh, I think I saw some figures the other day when they say a million babies die on the date of birth, the day of birth, every year. Mm -hmm. and you, you transfer this back into yeah. the uh, fairly recent past, the early modern yeah. period you were talking yeah. about. And most people, most women, have access to probably a woman within yes. the village or the hamlet who yeah. functions as a yeah. kind of midwife. Don't yeah. you? You know, she's probably doing a great job to the best of her knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the other side. This is the class perspective yes. as opposed to the, yeah. uh, you know, the textual yeah. side, which is really an upper-middle-class aristocratic yeah. feature, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Or a middling sort, I would say. Okay. Middling sort. I don't right. think this, this, this is an octavo. Um, the, the people who write about it are um, you, what you would call middling sort. They're not... Um, I mean, they're, they're people who might be trained through apprenticeship. Um, <coughs> oh, it, it, the Poetin's um, dialogue is for his wife, who's a midwife, although it's dedicated to an aristocratic woman he's trying to get patronage from. So that, there's, that's the only aristocratic connection that I've um, um, been able to establish. But otherwise, you are right. Yeah, there's, um, and it is, I mean, I'm not trying to say that these books are um, replace um, practical knowledge, which is probably better. Um, I wish I could remember the, the four midwives, London midwives, who are um, talking, but midwives tend to write from their own experience. Um, and there is a bit of a tussle between the physician who's got medical authority and a, a, the authority of having read lots of books in Latin and uh, midwives who are doing the job. So. You just follow them off from that point. They always mm. have been drawn by somebody who's never seen a newborn baby. Yeah. Yes. And it may well be that, that Gunnar yes. Reynolds was getting the information actually from the midwives. Yes, just was the one absolutely right. Them. Yes, he, he, I, he's probably never been at a birth. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he didn't draw these pictures. These are medieval pictures, and they, but they, they were also being produced by somebody who has probably never been at a birth. I mean, a lot of the knowledge is, that is coming from um, 
um, ancient authorities. So they, they, they've read books, that's all they've done. I, but I suppose for me the interest is in the opportunity it gives to, I suppose, create knowledge through um, engaging critically, discursively with it. Um, it. It's not medicine as we know it. So. Yeah, um, I just wanted to go back to this idea of written and oral culture yeah. and mm -hmm. um, whether there's other sources you can use to try yeah. and ascertain if there is a crossover by, by in perhaps core cases or yes. you, you mentioned in the Southern Hemisphere people who have this knowledge through yeah. anthropology perhaps yeah. and can we assume that women have a certain knowledge of how the body works? Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems incredible that that the man when he's speaking as dead body has no, has no knowledge of his wife's probably functions or so. Um, so I just I just wonder if he, if he, if we can make these assumptions that, that there was some sort of inherent knowledge that must have but there must have been because yeah. babies were delivered by midwives and um, you know I know that mortality is very high but that there are different reasons for that um, I suppose it's more f what's of more concern or interest for me is the way in which we've over relied on the written record um, uh, physicians like Willoughby who's scathing about midwives what they know and what they don't know so this is where there is a tussle we've over relied on that and I know that um, feminist historians uh, like Helen King have written really uh, brilliantly about um, well actually it didn't matter if they couldn't read but she accepts Willoughby's um, perspective and I'm saying, well, actually, we need to go back and rethink about what literacy means, means in the period, and that there might be a way uh, that we could establish interaction between the written and the oral, um, just as poet and dialogue suggests women engaging critically with a book that's written in English. So, does that, that's a, I felt that was yeah. a long, long winded <laughs> answer. So well, sorry. Well, can that be why well, there's a taboo for male writers not to write about it? Because they. They, it's just assumed that women know it's not Yes, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I was just thinking again about the um, oral reception of the book and the fact that in the continent, midwives have to do an exam, didn't they? That's what the book was for. Yes, um, yes, yes that's right. And yeah. they had to go and buy a copy of the book. But not midwives. in England, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Not, not in England. Um, no, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there's anything we can infer from that about the oral reception of this sort of knowledge. Was it more. Um, it was more important to England than it was on the continent. And why? Yeah. That it's well, it's about the testing because around. I don't think we know enough about how books are received. That there, if you're a physician in sixth, 16th century and you're being trained mm -hmm. at university, your the form of examination is going to be oral. Yeah. So I just think I just I suppose as a historian of reading, I don't think we factored that into the way in which we think. We've been obsessed with marking books with finding devices, with the, the textual trappings of book use. So we've not really thought enough about that oral context as a, as a part of education. And then, and then that extends to people who don't have formal education as well. So midwives in England are tested orally, but in the examples, the two examples I gave, books are part of that. So there's some evidence that they are, they are getting them. Yeah. 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 But we still think of midwives as illiterate. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really interesting um, paradox. Yeah. I think there are questions, but we should probably okay. close formal proceedings. Um, um, I'm sure you'll be able to talk in the week for the sentence. Um, thanks, Jane, for a fantastic paper. Thank you for the questions. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm by the questions. Thank you.